haven't been here the last couple weeks, we've been talking about this idea of the, uh, the core values of the church. These are the most important things that we believe, and these beliefs shape the way we do ministry here. They shape the way we handle things here. They shape uh, our lives, uh, our personal lives, and they shape everything about our church. And so uh, the first week, two, um, two weeks ago, uh, we said that Jesus is center. He is center in this place. And we figured because he's the most important person in human history, he might as well be the most important person in our church. And so uh, this is a church that's built on, founded on, centered on Jesus Christ. Last week we said that grace is greater. What we come to know is that Grace is God's unmerited favor towards us and that God's grace for us, no matter uh, what we've done or where we've been, who we are, God's grace is enough to cover every single area of our life. Uh, we learned that God wasn't trying to get us to follow rules and regulations to get to Him, but he, instead He gave us grace to cover us so that we could come into a relationship with Him. And today, um, on our next core value, that core value is relationships are greater than rules. Relationships are greater than rules. And here's what I mean when I say that. I mean that I don't believe and we don't believe that Jesus came to institute a whole bunch of rules and regulations. Jesus didn't come to burden us down with lists of religious rules. Jesus came so that we could be in relationship with Him. Amen. And you see, rules are good, but rules can't change lives. Rules can't change lives. If rules could change lives, then every single person who is... Uh, in the United States would follow all the rules. They would be changed because we have plenty of rules and regulations, but we have a whole bunch of people who've never been changed. And so we believe that religion forces rules on people. Religion excludes people through rules. Religion is trying to fit people into some kind of cookie-cutter mold and then they can belong. If you do this, if you say this, if you wear this, if you sing this, if you go here and don't go there, then you can become part of us. That's what religion says, but Jesus would say, come as you are. However you are, wherever you are, whatever you've done, you're welcome here. That's, we have a sign out in our foyer, and it says, no matter your story, you are welcome here. And we believe that. We believe that no matter what you've done or where you've been, that God loves you, that He cares about you, and that you are welcome in His house. Religion says, follow the rules and you can have a relationship. But Jesus says, start a relationship with me and I will teach you to follow the rules. That's the difference. That's the key. Rules are not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. But they cannot transform a heart. Rules are good, but they cannot change people. They cannot change people. Rules can never connect you back to God. Rules can only let you know that you are disconnected from God. Before you think this morning that I'm down in rules or saying that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, I think that we need to understand God's heart behind His rules. I, I think that's the best place for us to start this morning. Uh, what, I'm, what we're saying when we say relationships are greater than rules is that rules are good, but they're not the ultimate thing. They're not the most valuable thing. See, in the beginning... God created everything that we see. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He, he created everything that was created. And he said, it is good. It's good. And then he created mankind. 
And he looked through the portals of history and, and, and he seen everybody that would be. And he said, it is very good. It is very good. And then because we sinned, because we became broken in the process, God sent us some rules. He sent us some regulations. Because, not because He just wanted to regulate our actions, but because He knew exactly how life could be most enjoyed on planet earth. When God made rules, He wasn't trying to just restrict us. God was trying to say, inside of these boundaries, life can be most fully enjoyed. Inside of these boundaries, if you'll follow my ways, if you'll do life the way that I'm telling you to do life, you will enjoy life to the fullest. Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and life more abundantly. God's heart for you is for you to have the best life possible. That's what your goal for you is too. And the way you do that is by following God's rules. If you want your business to be more successful, do it God's way. If you want your marriage to be more successful, do it God's way. Whatever area of your life, God set rules in place so that uh, we could know where we need to live in life to experience this life to the fullest. God designed this world a certain way, and if we'll follow His ways, we will experience life to the full. But when you go outside of God's guidelines for your life, when you go outside of these guardrails, then you have to pay the consequences of the things you do. Whatever it may be, if you step out of God's way, you're going to experience a less fulfilling life. That's why God hates sin. It's not because He has a particular thing against those things. He just realizes that if you walk in sin, if you commit sin, you are giving up the best life possible for a lesser life. You're trading in the best life for a lesser life when you sin. That's why God hates it so much. And that's why He sent Jesus to redeem us from it. God hates sin because sin hurts his people. So rules are good when they're in their place. But there's a problem, uh, I guess, among all people, but especially here in, in our region. People take rules and they use them to hurt other people. See, rules are not designed to hurt people. They're designed to help people. When you take rules out of their context and you use them to beat people over the head instead of lifting people up and encouraging people into the life God called them to, then rules have become a bad thing. You are using something that God sent to help people to hurt people. God's law, God's rules, God's regulations were never used, were never supposed to be used for a weapon. And unfortunately, in many places and in many churches, they've took up the Bible to use as a weapon against each other instead of as a way to encourage one another. That's not God's heart. God is always more concerned about the person that is breaking the rule than the, pers- than the rule that is being broken. Have you ever met somebody who... It seemed like they were more upset that the rule got broke than the person got hurt breaking the rule. Do you know what I'm talking about? That, that they were, like the rule was the ultimate thing. Like I can't believe you crossed that line. I can't believe you broke that rule instead of being concerned about that person and what's going on in their life. If you have your Bible this morning, I want you to turn over to John 8. John 8. And in this story we're about to read, uh, there was a group of people who were willing to enforce the rules no matter who it hurt. They, they were trying to serve God, but they didn't realize that God's heart is never to hurt anybody. They were using God's rules as a way to hurt people. And so, 
John 8, and we'll start in verse 1 and read down to 11. It says, uh, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? What do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Woman, sorry I skipped down. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. Now, go and from now on sin no more. Jesus is... Coming off the Mount of Olives, he's sitting in the temple. And while all these people are gathered around him, while he was teaching these people, the Pharisees drag in a woman who was literally caught in the act of adultery. Like in the act of adultery. She would have literally been dragged out of bed straight into the temple. She might have had time to grab a bed sheet to cover her shame, but probably not. These men drag her and throw her at the feet of Jesus. And they say, Jesus, the Mosaic law says to stone women like these. What they didn't care to mention is that it says to stone the man too, but they didn't bring him around. Uh, but they say, the Mosaic law says to stone women such as these. What do you say? What do you say, Jesus? What do you think we ought to do with this woman? And Jesus does something that nobody sees coming. He doesn't yell at these guys. He doesn't scream at these guys because... Ultimately, he knows these guys are just as broken as that woman who they've dragged in. Jesus, all he does is he kneels down and he starts writing. We don't know what he wrote. Don't have a clue. There's been a lot of speculation. But he stands up and he says... Let him who is without sin throw the first stone. Just think about that. There was one person there that day who was without sin. This woman could have been stoned. Jesus was there and he had not sinned. He could have picked up that stone and threw it at her. And he would have been in the right. Justified. But that wasn't his heart towards this woman. These men who dragged her there, all they could see was a rule that was broken. Punishment that needed to be paid out. All they could see was something has to be done about this situation. They could not see that this woman was broken and hurt. They didn't care about this woman. They cared about proving a point. Side note, church, never prove your point at the expense of another person. 
It's not worth it. It's not worth it to be right and lose a friend. That one's free. These men drag this woman in front of Jesus. And, and he just bends down and starts writing. Now, I would love to know what he wrote. But we don't know. But when he bends back down and starts writing again, these guys start walking away. They start walking away. I'm not even going to speculate what Jesus may have wrote there on that day. But I tell you, some scholars believe that the place where Jesus was standing when all of this happened, they believe that in that part of the temple that the floor is made of stone. They believe that the floor is made of stone in that particular place. And so here's what we have going on. A woman who has broke one of God's commands, one of the Ten Commandments, has been brought to Jesus' feet. And the same finger that wrote, Thou shalt not commit adultery. 1,500 years earlier on stone tablets, <coughs> write something that declared this woman innocent in front of her accusers. The same finger that wrote those Ten Commandments wrote something in that temple floor, in that stone floor, that these men could not deny. <coughs> I don't know what he wrote that day. I don't know what he wrote. <coughs> but I do know what it says. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> I do know what it says. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> I'll get through it in just a minute. <clears throat> Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I do know what it says to me and you today. I don't know what he wrote that day, but I know what it says to me and you. That God's heart is for you, not for a set of rules. God loves you more than he loves a set of rules. He's more concerned about you coming to him in a personal relationship than he is concerned about you following all of the rules and regulations. Some of you today, you feel like you've been dragged out in the open. And everybody can see your shame. Everybody knows what's going on in your life. Everybody knows that your life's falling apart. Some of you feel like this woman did in front of all these men. She knew she was guilty and there was no way to deny it. No way to deny it. But Jesus is writing to you today something that's declaring you innocent. And when Jesus gets done with you, nobody will be able to stand and accuse you. You are my hero. Thanks so much. Jesus wants you to come into a relationship with him more than he wants you to conform to a set of rules. Becoming a Christian is not about adopting a set of morals or values. It's not about changing your voter registration. Becoming a Christian is not about following all the rules. It's about coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, so many times women or not, not women, people are identified by the choices that they've made, the mistakes that they've made. This woman, we know her as the woman caught in adultery. Maybe they know you as the one that got divorced, the one that got addicted, the one that was gay, 
the prostitute, the liar, the thief. So many times people identify us by the mistakes we've made. Ever happened to you? Happened to all of us. I want to tell you this morning, that's not how God sees you. That's not how God sees you. People will identify you by the rules you've broken. But that's not how God identifies you. God sees you as a person that He loves and not a rule that you've broken. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. God's not looking at you as a broken rule. God's looking at you as a person He died for. He loves you this morning. God sees you as a hand crafted masterpiece that he loves and that he realizes you're going to make mistakes but he loves you anyway God always chooses relationships over rules rules can't change lives but relationships can even with other people even with other believers when we get in a relationship with other believers Our life will be changed. That's why we choose relationships over rules. You can force people to follow rules, but you can't change people with rules. So what does that mean for us practically as a church? We've said every week of this that because we believe differently now, we live differently. First thing that we need to do is that we need to be intentional about valuing people over rules. Valuing relationships over rules. See, when people do us wrong, when people break the rules in our relationship, we want to throw the book at them. We want to get even with them. We want to make sure that they get what the rule says that they should get. Right? That's how we are. (coughs) We need to choose that relationship over that rule. When you have a choice between enforcing the rule and keeping the relationship, every single time, keep the relationship. Keep the relationship. There's a time in church when people have to be held accountable for sin in their life. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. People who claim to be believers, when they claim to be a believer, they put themselves accountable to the church. And we as the church, not an institution as the church, hold people accountable when they live in a constant continual lifestyle of sin we say hey I love you and you need to come out of this because this is not God's best for you and we say that after praying and after showing them love and and there's a time when we have to correct people who are in the church as painful as hard as that is it has to happen sometimes but let me make a clear distinction here We don't correct people who don't claim to be believers. You can't judge people by something they don't believe. If if they don't claim to be a believer, we have no authority to push anything in this on them. We can't hold them accountable unless they claim to be a believer. When we interact with those people, we love them. We care for them. We go out of our way, our way to help them. But we never correct them. We tell them about God's love and His grace. But it's not your job to fix sin in a non-believer's life. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. I just want to make that clear distinction. Uh. The second thing that it means for us today that 
relationships are greater than rules. In our area, the Bible Belt, there's a set of rules that everybody expects about church. They expect you to do this and don't do this. They expect it to be like this and it can't be like this. They expect you, uh, when you come to the church, to do this, this, and this. And they expect you not to do this, this, and this. There's a set of rules that people claim that are founded in the Word of God that are simply not. There's some religious rules out there. Expectations about church that are not founded in the Word of God. What I'm saying this morning is we're willing as a church to cross those lines, those religious lines, those religious rules to win relationships with people in the world. There's certain things that people say you ought not to do, but I'm here to tell you this morning as a church, we're willing to do anything short of sin to win lost people. If God's Word does not directly, clearly address it, if God's Word does not tell us that it's sin and it agrees with the Holy Spirit of the believers in this church, then we'll go for it if we think that it'll win lost people. Because we're not here to win popularity contests with the religious. We're not here to win popularity contests of the people in the churches around us. We're here to see lost people come into a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And whatever we have to do, that's what we'll do. And we'll do what nobody else is doing to reach those that nobody else is reaching. That's what we are about. And we're going to choose relationships with the people in this community over rules that other people have established every single time. Every single time. Our goal is not to get them to follow rules. Our goal is to have them encounter Jesus Christ. That's what we're about. Today... Uh, I'm getting ready to close and so the praise team can come on up. Uh, today, you, maybe you're here and you have never accepted Jesus Christ. Maybe it's your first time in church. Maybe it's your first time in church in a long time. I want to introduce you to this man named Jesus Christ who is central to our church. Who is pivotal in our church. See, everybody who calls this church home is connected by a belief, a similar belief in something. It's called the gospel, which means the good news, and it's good news about what Jesus has done for us. That's what the good news is about. Here's what we believe, and here's what we invite you to believe today. We believe that we're all sinful, separated from God because of that sin. We believe that God wanted a relationship with us and so he sent his son to die for us. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and died in our place. Jesus didn't deserve death, we did. But Jesus took our death on himself. And when Jesus died, everybody, died, everybody thought, that all hope was gone. Everybody thought that it was game over. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. He got up. That's the bottom line of our faith. Jesus is alive. That's why we're here today. Jesus is alive. That's why we can be saved today. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive this morning. And we believe that if you will believe that message and give God control of your life, that you'll be saved. Jesus will give you a new heart and a new life. He'll change the traje trajectory of your life. He'll give you a new heart.